Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 216, Pub Crawl. Board games to play at pubs, bars, and breweries. I'm Sean, and here with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We record all our podcast episodes live on Twitch, Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, and we love when folks join us. So tonight we've got someone looking for great games to bring out for a night at the pub. To go with that, we've got two game reviews that work pretty good for that. And if you're going with a friend or a partner, uh, we've got Shobu, a two-player abstract game. But if you're going out to join a group, we're going to review Psychobabble. We wrap up with our usual week in review, including the next Castle Panic expansion for us. That's Engines of War. First thoughts on Kapow and more. Find links, games mentioned, past episode callouts, and more through our show notes, which you can find at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 216. Links found there may be affiliate links which help support this show, while some products discussed during this program are provided for review by publishers. Let's get going with a trip to the suggestion box. Welcome to this week's suggestion box. Here we share some of the comments and other interactions we've had over the past week. Let's start off with a bit of praise from Daily Magic Games. They shared this on their social media accounts, along with a link to Castellans of Valeria preview. Mo is a top reviewer because he plays games multiple times before reviewing and makes sure he gets those rules right. That's something we always appreciate from him. To Mo, we say huzzah. Cheers. Well, thanks so much, Daily Magic Games. Uh, We greatly appreciate the shout out and the fact that the extra work we do playing games multiple times with multiple different groups is recognized and appreciated. Well, sticking with publishers that appreciate our work, next we have Housefish Balloon, who commented on our trick draw review to say, thank you so much, Tabletop Bellhop, for your super kind and thorough review. Sorry for the misunderstanding of it not being a trick-taking game. However, we are so glad you enjoyed it as much as we did. Were we super kind on that one? I don't remember being super kind. I remember being impressed it was better than we thought it was going to be. Anyway, uh, welcome, Housefish Balloon. I can't wait to see what you have up to offer next. What I'd like to see, because I only bought the single set of the box, and there's like room for a whole other deck, so give me a Trick Draw expansion. Give me more cards I can flip over and do cool things with. Well, next we have a series of happy fans. Silver Spire Games commented on our Dulce review to say, a great review. Sounds like a fun game. We're looking forward to trying. Scott Wood commented on our Underwater Cities unboxing to say, Hmm, the undersea theme is appealing. I'll have to go look at a webpage. See, that one we need to play more because I feel bad because they had to go somewhere else to find info on the game. We need to get a review up on that one. Well, Wade Vulgar commented on our Magical Kitties Save the Day review to say, Thanks for this. I picked up the soft copy deluxe set. Looking to run it for my daughter and her friend. And nice. Heavy Metal Hero commented on our Independence Incident review. I was unaware of this series. I'm a big fan of these types of games. Just ordered the whole series. Thanks. Nice. I'm sure Mark from Grand Gamers Guild appreciates that one as much as we did. Well, thanks, Heavy Metal Hero, Wade, Scott, Silver Spire Games, for those great ego-boosting comments. I could have used them today, so that was good timing. Well, let's wrap up with some cooperative board game recommendations from Ulysses Castillo. In response to our recent Best Cooperative Games episode, Allies in Fun. My top 10, none of which made your lists, if I remember right. Okay. The Loop, Marvel United, Familiar Tales, Adventures of Robin Hood, Pandemic, Castle Panic, D&D Wrath of Ashalardon, Professor Evil, and the Citadel of Time, Descent, Legends of the Dark, Dice Throne Adventures, with an honorable mention of Arkham Horror LCG and Adventure Tactics. Okay, that's a solid list. Now, I'm impressed. Like, that's 12 games that we didn't match up at all, which is kind of cool. And it just goes to show that not every game's for everyone. Everyone has different tastes. Now, most of these, I actually haven't had the pleasure of playing. So perhaps they would be on our list if I had tried them. Of the ones just listed, there are three that kind of stick out as I would love to play them. And that is The Loop, um, which is the cooperative time travel one where there's like a cube tower thing going on. Familiar Tales, which is about familiars from Wizards. And Dice Throne Adventures, I didn't realize there was a like cooperative, like adventure version of Dice Throne. 
I only knew it of as the the dice based dueling game, so that's cool. Now the D and D board games like Ashardalon, I personally have the Ravenlock version. I like at first. I like that they use the 4E rule set as the basis for them, and they're really cool, but I found they got a little too repetitive. Just changing up the map wasn't enough for me. And as for Castle Panic, well, we've been talking about that one the last few weeks because we're just discovering that game now. Well, I'd say rediscovering the base game, but it's discovering the um, expansions. And I've got to say my thoughts have changed on that one. As we check out each expansion, it ends up I'm enjoying the game even more. Well, either way, thanks for the list, Ulysses. I'll be sure to include all of these in the show notes. Remember that we appreciate all of your comments, even if we don't highlight them on the show. Next up, some important announcements about the coming weeks. We have a few things to cover before we get to the meat of the show. First up, just a reminder that our fifth birthday giveaway has just over a week left. We would plan to end it Wednesday after next week's show, but it ends up Gleam works a bit different from Rafflecopter, and that threw off the timing by one day. So the important part, though, is that you still have plenty of time to enter and plenty of time to let your friends and fellow gamers know so they can enter. If you somehow missed it, we're giving away a choice of one of five of the best games we played for the first time during our last year of podcasting and two exclusive Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast mugs. Now, next up, I want to announce that next week or tomorrow, for those of you listening to this uh, in the audio version that just came out, Wednesday, August the 23rd, we are going to host a live Q&A as part of and potentially all of our next podcast recording. Now, Deanna and I are going to be out of town for a couple of days. And then after that, we've got a special guest heading into town. So we're trying to keep things light and open that night. So there's not a lot of prep work that goes into the show for that episode. Now, we might be able to fit in a review. I'm I'm leaning towards, well, we might review some boop, but I'm not promising anything at this point. It'll depend how much I can get done before we head out to town. While we considered canceling the show for next week, we didn't want to do that because that would mean canceling two weeks in a row because... Our family is heading back up north to take a week off and relax before the kids go back to school in September. Now, we're staying at my aunt and uncle's farmhouse in beautiful Campbellford, Ontario. And while I'm sure we'll play some games, which we'll talk about when I get back, thinking about work is going to be off the menu that week. So next week, Q&A, and then we should be back to recording on September 6th. We're here to answer your gaming game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from fan Danielle Thomas, better known to fans of the show as Mage Kayla. Danielle asks, what are your suggestions for games that are good to play in a pub? Games that are easy to grab, easy to set up, quick to play, and don't piss off the staff. (laughs) Now, Danielle had a little more about what games are good while drinking. And while we touched on this, it could be another show topic completely. Yeah, I think I'd like to do another list on that, though it does kind of encourage drinking a lot. And I don't like to encourage drinking too much. But thank you, Danielle, for the great topic suggestion and for your longtime support of our show. Now, before we get to our list of great games for a pub crawl, let's take a hint from Danielle's question and talk a bit about what makes for a good bar game. I also think there's a note that I want to mention right here is that we are the tabletop bellhop gaming podcast. So we're looking at tabletop games to play at a pub, not pub games. Like when you say pub games to certain people, you say pub games to me. I think of the games we're talking tonight, but you say them to my dad even. And he's thinking darts, shuffleboard, pool, billiards, or uh, folded paper football, 20 questions, pub trivia. All the games have been played in bars and pubs for years now. Also, we understand pubs and other locales for imbibing adult beverages aren't for everyone. We are tonight, however, focusing on that sort of venue specifically, which tend to have different vibes, benefits, and potential problems from other venues like coffee houses or restaurants. While we are not endorsing alcoholic beverages, we do partake ourselves, though understand this episode might not fit in your needs or interests, and we won't be upset if you skip to the reviews later. Yeah, while the reviews might be good drinking games or games to play while well, drinking, they don't require it in any way, and they're just as good at a coffee shop or at your own game table. So what makes for a good tabletop game to bring to a pub? Let's start with one that Danielle already called out, and honestly, it's one of the best things, and I love that she called it out, and that is that people don't always think about it, and it is pissing off the staff. When playing in any public place, you want to avoid things like overly loud games, games that take up a lot of room. 
if you have to move tables, that's pretty much a no-no. And you also don't want to take up extra room just for the game. Putting drinks on another table might work for game night, but you don't want to take up a table that could have other patrons at it during a bar night. Dice can also be a problem. While most of us gamers love the clattering of dice, they can be quite loud and disruptive if you're not the one playing with the dice. Maybe bring a padded dice tray to help with this. Even just playing games might not be accepted at some places. Some pubs want tables to flip. They want people to come in, get a round or two, and get out so the next group can come in and get their own couple of rounds. They don't want someone sitting there playing board games for six or more hours. Now, this is going to depend a lot on the venue, and you're going to have to make a judgment call based on your establishment of choice and always err on the side of caution and say, hey, is it cool if we set up a game here? Now, we covered a lot of this stuff back on episode 12. The next round is on you and the do's and don'ts of tabletop gaming at cafes and pubs article on the blob. But that was back in 2018. So some of this bears repeating. That was a long time ago. I, I somewhat kind of want to beg you not to watch <laughs> episode 12. So, man, we were we we uh, we there were a lot less of us back then. I put that video on. I'm like, man, a lot less grade, too, uh, uh, and a lot less audio quality. <laughs> now, Danielle said the staff don't piss off the staff, but you also don't want to piss off other patrons. Uh, be sure you're not taking up too much space, like physically, like you're standing up, you're getting excited or getting into other people's personal space. Now, like, for example, of a game that, that you may not realize is not a great pub game is Pitch Car. It sounds great. I brought it to pubs until I realized that Pitch Car, everyone's moving around the table and having to get the right angle and leaning in like they're about to take a pool shot and sticking their butts in the people sitting next to us. I realized, I'm like, okay, well, this was fun tonight. I'm not going to bring this one out again on a pro game night where I can say, hey, can we reserve some tables over in the corner? Maybe, but not just on an average night that's filled with your average patrons as well as you playing games. Again, we are assuming here that you haven't set up a game night at a pub. You're right. just out for drinks with some friends in and amongst the rest of the regular patrons. Now, the other thing they mentioned is easy to grab games. You want portable games. For one, they take up less space, which we already mentioned something is to consider. They take up less space on the table. Um, they're also easier to carry, but more importantly, there's less packaging or box you have to find a spot for. This is something that I sometimes make this mistake. I, I forget about the fact that the box, the what everything comes in, or the board game backpack I brought, or my Metro carrying bag full of games also needs room. I tend to bring pretty small footprint games, but sometimes those pretty small footprint games, including one we're going to mention tonight, happens to have a bigger than needed box. Well, the game fits great on the table. I now have a box that I have nowhere to put. If there are less than four of you, you might have an extra chair you can use yeah. to store a box, but don't count on it. And if there's only two of you, you can't be sure you'll get a four top to play at. And I would recommend if there are only two of you and there's a choice between a two and a four table, don't steal the four table because you plan on playing games. Well, unless the place is completely empty and you're not expecting it to fill in, but you want the bar wants those seats filled, whether it's with gamers or not. Please don't take up more room than you need. Now, a trick that I actually learned from Danielle and Owen, which I think is, is appropriate since it was their question tonight, is reboxing your games. This can really help with the big box, not much stuff issue uh they in particular showed me two photo cases one of those things where it's i don't know plastic and you snap it together and inside are all these little tiny boxes and they had rpgs in there they had uh various different card games they even had full board games it's amazing how little space some of your games take if you just cut them down to the bare minimum so i strongly recommend if you are going to be playing out and about at bars pubs cafes also at restaurants and so on Rebox your games, put them into something smaller and more portable. That's really easy to just put the nice plastic, easy to clean case on the bar floor while you're playing the game on the table. Now, another reason to consider reboxing is not showing up looking like someone who might annoy your uh, the <laughs> staff, even just looking like someone who might hog a table and not spend much money could be a yeah. negative. So walking in with a big old board game box could set off some red flags with staff. Next, quick to play. 
that's pretty much a given, right? Pubs aren't really the spot for that five hour Euro. Another thing though, is quicker games are easier to stop. You finish game rounds more often. I've often found on longer bar game nights that after the first round of games and after the first round of drinks, people are a little less interested on in continuing. Sometimes it's the third round. Sometimes it's the fifth round of a game that they're like, I've had enough. Now with short games, it's way easier for people to step out between rounds or to just say, you know what, let's call the night and put the game away instead of, well, yeah, you know, I've kind of had enough and I'm having a hard time thinking and I wish we were playing something later, but there's still seven rounds to go in this game. You don't want to be in that position where if you're playing 10, 15 minute, half an hour at the most games, it's really easy to go. Okay. That's it for this round. Who wants in for the next round? Or, hey, let's grab something else. Or, you know what, let's just uh, let's order some food and sit and chat for a bit. Maybe we'll pick the games up later. Now, also, games that are quick to play are generally more amicable to social interaction. Yeah. There's probably a reason you're out at a bar and not at someone's home. And part of that is probably social. Everyone sitting, staring, focused on the next action and ignoring everyone else around them may not be the ideal pub situation. Now, I would also add you want quick to learn games because quick games aren't necessarily quick to learn. Sitting at a brewery with a tasting flight in front of you is not the time to try to explain to a group of players how to play Brew Crafters, the board game, despite the fact it may be highly thematic at the time. That's a pretty heavy euro that no one wants to sit through a teach of that lasts longer than your drinks. Plus, the more people drink, the less able they're going to be to learn something new. And familiarity is kind of the key. You want to play familiar, well-known, or at least easy to teach games. Now, while your personal mileage may vary, and we always encourage responsible drinking, inebriation is going to impact, impact gameplay. That's yeah. just how it works. Now, one not on Danielle's list, and this is for the person bringing the games, is make sure to bring games that are cheap, easy to replace, or easy to clean. Or all of the above. One of the things you have to be concerned with, but don't want to be worried about all night saying, no, don't, don't, don't do that, is potential spills from drinks and other grease and grime from food and, well, grease and grime from being in a bar. Don't bring your $300 deluxified foil card Uber rare out of print signed by the designer game to the pub. Do bring a $10 card game that's already been played 50 times and looks a little grimy, but you can replace it for another 10 bucks. And if someone happens to step on a card on the floor and or you play it on a table where you can't pick it up because the table's so sticky, um, you just go buy another copy. Do bring games that are easy to clean. Less cards, more tiles, less cardboard, more neoprene, and so on. A perfect example is a recent night we had at a pub where the tables were sticky. Nasty sticky yeah you can't assume you're going to be able to ask for a different table and the problem wasn't even actually a type of dirt but the type of coating they put on the wood yeah someone varnished this table with the wrong kind of varnish and i think it'll be forever tacky uh, this was bad we, we basically ruined a card playing the game and then put placemats down and played on top of those so yeah so, of course, what goes along with this and the chat's already calling it out as well. Good call, Ryan. A side note, protect your games, especially those you're going to bring out to a pub. For tips on this, check out episode 208 of our podcast named Damage Control. Now, at the most basic, here's where I do and would suggest actually sleeving your cards. Play mats or even just some paper can help, too. We solved our sticky table problem by using the menus. Put our cards down on another one you may want to do now this one this one's going to vary depending on you and your group but higher player count games you never know when someone might show up that you weren't expecting or you might be open to letting strangers into your game now this may be a me thing mainly but sometimes i run into other fellow gamers i know or when i'm out for a pint or we're sitting on the patio and someone walks by and i'm like hey come on join us also, there's other times we're playing someone and someone comes over like, oh, what are you playing? That looks really cool. And we're like, hey, sit down. Well, I'll teach you to play this. I'm the tabletop bellhop. How's it going? You're going to love this game. So I like bringing games with higher play counts. Even if it's just two of us, I'll make sure I have a four player game with me just in case. Now, this is definitely a hit or miss thing. And depending on you and your friend group, make sure everyone you're with is going to be OK mm. with others joining in. And you're not turning something everyone else thought of as a couple's night out into an event. Now, another one I 
actually recommend you bring are a confrontational player versus player take that style of games. I've found over many years of hosting public play events that these tend to do better at our bar drinking game nights than, say, cooperative games. This is just a, I think it goes with the alcohol or the, the loss of inhibitions, but people who indulge in a few drinks seem to really enjoy messing with other players, screwing other players over, and also care a little bit more about winning, even if the game isn't so serious. Now, on the other hand, I've noticed people drinking tend to get a little more frustrated with the other players in a cooperative experience than they probably would at home. Now, a night at a pub is when games like Munchkin and Flux will actually get played. And when I'll leave games like Pandemic at home, even if all the players coming out that night know how to play it very well. This could also go hand in hand with the complexity. Co-op games often have aspects that require a little more thinking and planning, combos between players, or figuring out if what you will do you know, will benefit the next player, and so on. Now, Ryan in our chat just called out, by that measure, Uno sounds like a solid pub game night option, and I agree. Uno is a great choice. We didn't toss it on our list tonight. It's, it's not really a hobby game, though we didn't stick to all hobby games anyway. I would recommend Uno. That's, that's a good one. Like, Uno is the game that if I owned a pub, would be there for people to play like connect four and uno and, and again if also fits the familiar if it's the small footprint it works who knows a good one just make sure you play by the real rules ah, who cares I, <laughs> actually i think of pub nights when you let someone stack four pick up fours on top of each other no monopoly though <laughs> not all mass market games are good for pubs all right sean mentioned this uh a bit earlier but i'm, I'm just going to call back to it is you want social games I, we assume that the reason you're going to a pub is because you want to be out and about with other people and you want games where you can socialize and chat and hang out and catch up and get distracted and talk about whatever the latest thing you had on TV. So this goes with the lighter and quicker thing mentioned earlier, but even some light quick games take a lot of focus and that's not what you want. You don't want any game where everyone's focused on the game so that all they're worried about is who wins the game and making their next move and planning. That's just not the game you want for a social pub night. You want the game where you're like, ah, ha, ha, how's it going? Yeah, okay, it's my turn. Sure, um, I'll play this one and see what happens. Okay, let's get back to our conversation about the latest sports ball game. You also don't want games that prohibit talking. Well, The Mind may seem like a perfect pub game, Unless your pub has a vow of silence, it's really not. Indeed, as I spoke of earlier, the game should be a social lubricant, not a stop sign. For now, mm -hmm. though, let's get on with some game recommendations. All right, so the first game that popped into my head uh, that when, when I read this question on our thing, and probably when Danielle asked the question originally on our Twitch stream, is Skull. And the main reason is this is a bar game originally, like going back to Skittles and some of the games people played at bars. This was a game created by bikers played with coasters originally. So it just makes sense to play the game that originated by bikers playing in a bar and drinking to play at a bar while drinking. So Skull is kind of a light social deduction game and in the way that poker can be kind of social deduction because you're trying to read the other players combined with a bit of push your luck, right? The the whole thing here is you're using your bravado to brag how many coasters you can flip over without revealing a skull. And then the next person can upbid you. And then they have to tell people to reveal their, their coasters. And if a skull comes up, uh, they lose. And if the skull doesn't come up, they win. And if you win twice, you win the whole game. And if you lose three or four times, I don't even remember you're out of the game and there's a little bit more to it, but that's basically it. It is. It started as a drinking game. I'm sure you didn't have points in the original. I'm sure it was pound your drink or something like that. One of the best things about Skull is it literally can play any number of players as long as you have the components for it. And for years, there were two publishers that published this game and one published Skull and one published a game called Roses. And they got together and put out a set called Skull and Roses that doubled the player count. But unfortunately, the Roses half seems to be gone now and all you can get is Skull. But really, you can make your own copy with beer coasters or whatever. You just need three of one kind and one that's different. And the one that's different, try to find something with some kind of skull on it because that makes it very obvious. Can you bring a kid's game to a bar night? Absolutely. 
Kids' mm-hmm. dexterity games are often perfect for a night at the pub, as they often have small footprints, are portable, have super easy to pick up rules and themes, and actually get more challenging later in the night. Now, for this, we called out Go Cuckoo, as it's one of our favorites, but you could very easily put others here. Just make sure you're watching out for small parts or things potentially rolling away. Next, I said, don't bring the mind, but from Pandasaurus, do bring the game. This is the game. The game is the game in my collection that gets played the most often at pubs, uh, both two player with just Deanna and I, when we're out for a double date night with Tori and Kat, when we're out at chapter two and someone's walking by the patio and we're like, hey, come join us and play a game. This is a single deck of cards, uh, numbered two to 99. And then um, some little marking cards to show if you're counting up or down. You're trying to play the cards in order. It sounds really simple, but that, that's it. That's the basics is you get a hand of cards and you're trying to play them in order. I, everyone picks it up right away, but it's highly engaging. And it does the whole, the more you drink, the harder it is to play thing, which I find usually works pretty well, especially once you get to that point where everyone's in that, that, um, there's a term Deanna uses I don't want to throw in here. When you're floaty and you're like, wait, why did you do that? You knew it should have been this. And remember, I had an eight and you laugh about it instead of being angry about it. Next, I have Brew Crafters, the travel card game, which seems to have been renamed Microbrewers. And I don't know if Microbrewers has the travel card game after it. Um, This is from the same company that did, um, did uh, Brew Crafters. And I completely forget the name of the company, so sorry. We're not calling out companies as much. If, if I think of them, I'll mention them. Uh, this is an obvious choice when you're going to a brewery, right? Like, I actually have a goal to play Brew Crafters, the travel card game, and as many brewers as I can. Now, this is a step above most mass market games. So this isn't necessarily the one to bring when you're going to hang out with your drinking buddies who aren't normally gamers. But it's something that is definitely pretty light or a hobby board game for people who are used to playing more difficult games. Uh, this is a tableau building, engine building card game that is about brewing beer and highly thematic in it about collecting the right resources and hiring people for your brewery and improving your brewery. It's it's actually a really neat game that does a good job of capturing the, the beer making elements that is small, portable, fits in a back pocket, simple card game. And Brewcrafters, the travel card game, a.k.a. Microbrewers, is by Greater Than Games, uh, among Thank other you. publishers. Uh, originally self-published, actually. Uh, so next up, we have, well, a pack of cards. I mean, okay, yes. it's not the hobby board game suggestion you're probably looking for, but come on. People have been playing cards in pubs for decades or centuries, mm-hmm. possibly. There is <laughs> nothing saying you have to break that tradition. Whether it's hearts and spades or 31 for higher player counts, there are so many options with this classic go-to. Okay, hobby gamers, you don't want to play traditional card games. You're beyond them or whatever your problem was with them. Uh, Let's go to then a modern trick-taking game. And I'm going to pull out of the ones we've been playing recently is Thrones of Valyria. Uh, Mainly because it plays three to six players. With an even number of players, you're playing teams. If you're playing an odd number, you're just playing uh, everyone plays in Rome. Uh, Last person standing, basically, or or highest points wins, I guess. Uh, This is one of the best modern trick-taking games we've played and has been a huge hit with a large number of gamers. This is one of the ones that I have been taking out to the barbershop bar. We had a great time with it ourselves, playing it with Sean, playing it with Tori and Kat, playing it with the extended family. Once I got it out to the public, it was an even bigger hit. Now, this has the advantage of only having two rounds. You only play through two hands, so it doesn't take all night. Plus, to Sean's chagrin, they already look kind of grimy because of the art on the card, so you don't have to worry too much about marking these up. Now, another dexterity game, but one that doesn't rely on the player's ability to stack things is drop it this Mm -hmm. could be a better fit especially later in the night now we love this tetris like game of dropping different shapes and colors of blocks and i would say that this is the most popular game out of everything we have ever brought to Mm -hmm. the barbershop bar since we started there uh, as a public event 
Jumping back to mass market games you can pretty much get anywhere, I have to recommend Racco, which Dan and I rediscovered uh, due to a brewery, the Bandit Goose Brewery in Kingsville. This was on the shelf one night. We were there having pints, and I thought it'd be funny to grab it, and then it ended up, I'm like, Dan has never played Racco. So we sat down, I taught her to play Racco, and she loved it as much as I did. Remember, Dan is the heavy gamer out of our group, too. But this one is just super casual, and it is awesome for that you're barely playing a game while hanging out and chatting. You're just chatting, laughing, hanging out, listening to the music, clapping to the band and looking, going, hey, OK, I'll put my three here and throw that 37 out. Oh, they picked it up. Oh, well. OK, yeah, yeah. OK, OK. What am I going to play next? Now nah, I don't have anything good in my hand. I'll draw. Right. It's just so simple. The only problem I have with Racco for a pub night is it only plays four players. Now, speaking of low player counts, let's say it is a couple's night and you're not expecting to hang out with anyone else. And you don't want to invite anyone else to the table. One of the classic bar night games for hobby gamers is Hive. It's a great two player abstract game that has the huge advantage of having almost invulnerable tiles that are impervious to dirt and pretty much impossible to damage. This is one Dan and I used to play a lot. We used to bring Hive everywhere. Um, we have the full version, not the pocket version. The pocket version, I think, would be even better. Um, it's a Bakelite tiles. It's in a, like, what? what's not, I don't think it's a waterproof bag, but, like, it's in a sealed bag. Um, just take the instructions out, and you could probably dunk this thing in the water. And, heck, on Board Game Geek, I've seen people play it at the bottom of a pool. We played this a ton until the next game on this list came out. The next one being the Duke. Now, the Duke has a lot going for it. It's the most chess-like abstract game that's not actually chess, and in my opinion, way more fun. Now, we've yeah. mentioned this one a lot, but it has been some time. So the thing is, you need to catch the opponent's Duke. Each piece shows how it moves on the piece, with the neat bit being that you flip them over after you move, to a different way of moving on the other side of that piece. And yep. the only real disadvantage is it is a two player only game. And we noticed that it's a little hard to get at the moment, but it is still being published. Sticking with two player only abstract games, I'm going to bring up Shobu. This, like Hive and uh, uh, the Duke to some part, the Duke does have a board. So more like Hive, this one's great for not having to really worry about spills. The components in this game are a silk rope, some wooden boards, and some stones, like literal stones. Uh, it's a really simple grid-based movement where you're going to make a passive move, then make a matching aggressive move, which can push opponent's pieces on the opposite colored board with the goal of knocking off all the opponent's pieces on one of the four boards. It is a really solid abstract strategy game that's super easy to learn, but man, is there a lot of depth and strategy here. Now stick around as we'll be doing a deep dive into Shobu later in the show. Next up, Telestrations, particularly the 12 player party pack. This is one of our all time favorite party games, but there is one concern here and that is your group getting to be a bit too loud. Yeah. Now, if that's not a problem where you are, go for it. There's a band playing. They won't hear you. This is yep. a formalized version of Eat Poop You Cat or the telephone game, but with drawings. You draw something, pass your book, that person looks at your drawing and writes what they saw. That then gets passed and the next person draws based on what is written out and back and forth and so on and so on. As for scoring, does anyone actually keep score for this game? Uh, no, thanks. Oh, wait, no, that's the next <laughs> game. Sorry. Uh, no, thanks. We're going to we're, we're moving into higher player count games here. I think uh, we are going to have a bunch of those to wrap up here. So the first high player count game, higher player count game though we mentioned one earlier is no thanks. Uh, this is super simple to teach plays pretty quick. Um, it's also great for getting people chatting during play. And I found this one that once people have a couple drinks, it starts to get a little more competitive. And trash talk is pretty common, as is egging people on. Come on, spend the chip. You can do it. You can do it. Or take the card. You'll be fine. You know the 14's still out there. That kind of talk I see a lot in um, later in the night games of No Thanks at Bar Game Nights. Now, if somehow you don't know this game, you get past a card and you either put a chip on it and pass it on or take it. 
your score at the end of the game is all the cards you took minus your chips that you have left. The twist is you only score the lowest card in a run and the lowest score wins. That's pretty much no thanks. Next, I have the Great Del Moody, which for some reason is just making me think of how many games on this list are older games that we've talked about a lot over the last five years. But anyway, the Great Del Moody for years was my favorite high player count ladder based card game. This is the game that I play with my aunts and uncles and at one time my grandmother when she was still around. This is my casual gamers. Um, it, let's play something a little better than something with a deck of cards. I would break this one out. Now, the goal of this game is to avoid your hand. The deck here is 13 different suits where you have 13, 13s, 12, 12s, 11, 11s, and so on, all the way down to the Great Del Moody, which is the one. Each hand starts with a set of matching cards. The next player has to play the same number of cards, but a lower number. Now, the whole thing is if you can't do it, the person before you wins the trick and gets the lead. First one to empty their hand becomes the Great Del Moody. Last person to enter their hand becomes the Greater Peon, and there's some fun rules in there for what the Del Moody can do, what you can make the Peon do. Players in the middle are merchants that can trade and so on. I have been playing this game at pub game nights for years. Well, there we go. Next up, we're going to finish off with a final high player count game, which is, believe it or not from us, a social deduction game yeah. for up to 11 players where you aren't forced to lie. This is Psycho Babble. Now, this features a hidden trader style role still, but even the trader doesn't know for certain they are a trader until the end. Mm -hmm. now, one of the best things about this game is the artwork. This one, you can expect other tables are going to be like, what are you playing? And if you stick around, we'll have more info on Psycho Babble as that's our other review tonight. So those were our suggestions. Games I would, and in most cases, have actually brought out to a pub, bar, or brewery to play. Now, leading up to this episode, we asked our fans what games they think are great to bring to the pub. And here's what they came up with. Jaipur, a solid two-player game. That's a maybe due to requiring a bit of focus, so you lose out a bit on the social aspect. It could have been on the list if we didn't limit it to 15. Hanabi. Yeah, I can see it. And when I did a little Googling to see if there were any games I forgot and other people's lists of top bar games and geek lists with bar games, everyone mentioned Hanabi. But to me, this one gets into that too much concentration level. The you have to be focused on the game. You have to be paying attention if you want to play Hanabi. You're watching whether players' cards are. You're look, looking for their their um what's the word the the tells. You're looking for their tells. You're looking for those subtle hints on what cards to play. And to me, that's just a better one for playing. You know, when you're caffeinated and on some coffee, maybe instead of having some drinks. I think you take Hanabi too seriously. Honestly, I, I've never won a game of Hanabi, and I Everyone still have fun I playing it. it. Now, uh, everyone I played Hanabi with takes it too seriously, though. I don't even own it because I don't like it because it's you, know, you can't talk and people are <laughs> get mad when you make the wrong move and when you discard a card and then people throw their cards across the table and flip the table. And Hanabi's a super competitive, nasty people game. I don't know. <laughs> that's not just one group. That's that's I, I everyone I played Hanabi with is like that. Uh, next one, Tinderbox. I have been seeing this a lot. Um, it is a gram-worthy game. People sure like posting reels and TikToks of playing Tinderbox. This, I, I want a copy of this one. Now, it's one of those mint tin size boxes, so totally wins on the uh, no table space, no, no, no. You want to know where to put the box, you put it in your breast pocket, right? So it, it's a dexterity game about building a tiny fire with stacks of wood, charcoal, and little flame cubes and stuff. It looks great. Um, I, I haven't actually read the rules, but I'm assuming you just keep playing until someone knocks it over. Maybe it's like, uh, it could be like the, oh, there's one we could have had on the list, but it's a kid's dexterity game. So we kind of did. Kind of like Rhino Hero, where maybe you're using cards. I know I haven't actually played it, but I got to say it's, it's on my wish list. A Tinderbox looks like a perfect game for that. At least for most bar nights, not with Deanna. Deanna does not like dexterity and she would not like Tinderbox. So uh, your favorite version of Love Letter. Yeah, we can see this. And while, while we're not huge fans, that's one place where we will play this series of games. Yeah, if you're like, uh, let's have some pints. I'm going to bring us some Love Letter. I'll be like, okay. Remind me how to play this particular version. I'll go for it. Uh, Cockroach Poker. I saw multiple people recommend this. 
I saw people tonight in our chat room were bringing this one up as well. I I, I feel bad. I never played this. I, I don't even know how to play. I have no idea what it's about. I I, I don't know. I don't know what cockroach poacher is. I, I can recognize the box. Someone's going to have to teach me what cockroach poker is so I can see if it belongs on this list. Never played it. If anyone has it, bring it Saturday to the barbershop bar. Speaking of other games that I've never played is Picomino or Picomino. I think it's Picomino like Domino, but I'm not positive. I hadn't heard of this one. Um, no cardboard, small, portable. It's dice and tiles. The tiles kind of look like dominoes, but they're not. Uh, age eight up, which sounds about right for drinking adults. So next up, point salad. This one is great and, and really should have probably been on the list. I love this yeah. one. I love it at bars. I've played it drinking. It's been played at bars and breweries. Uh, this is a fantastic choice. Thanks, Tech, for mentioning that one, mentioning that one in the Discord. We fully endorse that. Yeah, that was the one I saw, and I was like, oh, do I take no thanks off our list and put that there instead? Um, next one we have uh, from the fans is Pandemic the Cure. Uh, yeah, this is a better choice than Pandemic. Um, this is the dice version where you're rapidly rolling dice, and it does some nice stuff for corralling the dice where it gives you, like, these rings that they, they stay in, so I like that. Do watch that dice rolling sound. It can be very annoying if you're, you know, trying to watch the game at another table and enjoy your drinks and you keep hearing the clattering. So that'll depend on the venue you're at. Um, I enjoyed Cure the time I played it, but as I've noted on other recent shows in the last year, I'm just not at all interested in playing anything called Pandemic. Um, after the last three years, I'm, I'm done with Pandemics uh, and always possible. And our last one on the list um, that we had ahead of time here is Quicks. Uh, this is a very popular, pretty much mass market roll and write. I say pretty much because I tend to see this one in educational toy stores than say Toys R Us, but it's out there at some of the big box stores as well. I've never tried this one, but we do know our own personal paladin loves this, strongly recommends it. Um, also a great game to play while waiting for your food at a restaurant, I've been told. Well, that's it for our talk about games to bring to a pub, bar, or brewery. What is a game you pack when heading out for a pint? Was it on our list? If not, be sure to tell us about it in the comments. I have a question for us. Hit us up with an email. Questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Head over to the blog, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop. It's time to take a look at the abstract strategy board game, Shobu, from Smirk and Laughter Games, who we have to thank for letting us snag a review copy at Origins. Shobu is a two-player-only board game designed by Jamie Sajik and Manolis Vranis that was published by Smirk and Dagger Games under their Smirk and Laughter imprint back in 2019. This vaguely chess-like game is quick to learn with an age suggestion of 8+, plus, but can be quite difficult to master. While the playtime is listed as 15 to 30 minutes, we've seen games go longer when you have a couple of equally matched players who spend a lot of time planning their moves. So Shobu is a grid-based, slide-and-push style abstract strategy game featuring four boards with four stones for each player on a line on opposite ends of each board. These are four by four boards. Each turn, players will take a passive movement, moving one of their stones on their half of the table. Then they'll take an aggressive move that mirrors that original move, but has to be made on the opposite colored board. This aggressive mood is the one that can push other stones around, and your goal is to clear one of the four boards of your opponent's stones. One of the things that sticks out about this game is the components, which mm -hmm. you can get a good look at in our Shobu unboxing video on YouTube. Now, what you're going to see there are four wooden boards, too light, too dark, with a 4x4 four four grid on one side of each of them. There's a silk knotted rope, 17 stones in two colors, light and dark, and a rule book that's really a single page, two-sided folded in half. No, do you only get 17 stones, but you only need 16. The bonus is a nice quality of life improvement there in case you lose any of your stones. The rules here are particularly good, with plenty of examples using photos of the game being played with graphical overlays showing legal and illegal moves. Yeah, I particularly like this, like someone took a camera and took pictures of the game being played. You don't usually see that in rulebook. Now, one thing I do think is worth noting here is that, yes, you could easily make your own copy of Shobu uh, with sheets of paper and coins, or you could go down to the beach and draw the board into the sand and use shells and rocks. That said, the components here are nice, 
And I don't mind paying for a game I could make myself, even if it's just to compensate the creators. Well, let's move on to a more concise overview of play in Shobu. Start by setting out the boards grouped so that each player has a light and dark board in front of them with a matching set on the opponent's side. Place the silk rope between these and then place four rocks from each player on each board. So the rocks are on the rows closest to their player. Whoever is playing black goes first. Each turn, players make two moves, a passive move and an aggressive move, and they have to be made in that order. You have to complete your passive move, and then you have to make your aggressive move, and you always have to make both moves. For your passive move, pick any of your pieces on your side of the board, the side of the rope you're on, and move it one or two squares in any direction. That includes diagonally. Note, you can't move through any other pieces when doing this. Next, make a matching aggressive move. Move another of your pieces, the same number of spaces and direction as your passive move, but on the opposite colored board. This move can push other stones out of the way as long as they aren't in turn blocked by another piece. Any piece pushed off of any board uh, this way is removed from the game. Keep doing this until one of you manages to knock all the opponent's pieces off one of the boards. No one, not all. You don't have to clear all four, you just have to do one. That's it. You can now go out and play Shobu. It sounds simple, and mechanically it is. But trust me when I say it is not nearly as easy to clear a board as you might think. In this way, Shobu does what I want any abstract strategy game to do. I want it to be simple to learn and difficult to master. Yes, we say it a lot. Every reviewer says a lot. Publishers say it a lot. That's what this game is. Well, learning the available moves is easy. Knowing how to move your pieces to win is the real key, and Shobu has that in spades. Now, this is one of those games where you start off and you're like, all right, this seems pretty easy. Move a piece, passive, move another piece, aggressive, and you're knocking some stones off here and there and kind of going back and forth. And even halfway through the game, there's a bit of give and take going on, but things still flow pretty well, and good moves are pretty easy to spot. Then things change. Suddenly, one of you is in trouble on one of the boards, and the game starts to become more about preventing your pieces from being pushed than pushing your opponent's pieces. And that's the part of the game where it really starts to shine for me. On top of that, well, simple, the components of this game are quality and give the game a great presence in front of you. Mm -hmm. The solidity of the stones feeling nice to push and making a great sound when they clunk off of a board onto the table. Yeah, I also dig the look and potentially even more so the like the feel of the game. I like the touch and feel of the stones. They're they're nice. They're tumbled. They're smooth. Um, like this is honestly one of those quality of life improvements we are talking about recently on our podcast that I appreciate. This game could have easily had a fold out board and cardboard counters, but instead it's got these handcrafted feeling components. Similarly, they could have gone with less abstract components using pawns or other components and themed it but that would have been excessive and detracted from the simplicity of the gameplay. Yeah, when I was grabbing the description of this game from the publisher for our unboxing video, I always include whatever the publisher said about it, because at that point I haven't usually played the game, so I don't, I, I'm gonna go with their words instead of mine. I caught one quote that I thought fit this game perfectly. It says, Shobu evokes the feeling of go where chess, sure, but provides its own unique challenge. It feels immediately familiar and yet is wholly distinct and engaging. It's that second part about feeling immediately familiar that felt very true to me. This just feels like a game that's been around for decades, if not centuries, and something not something that's four years old at all. You could tell people that this was some ancient game discovered in the pyramids, and no one would argue with you unless they had checked the Board Game Geek entry. Now, the only problem I can see with this game uh, for other people in game groups is if you don't like abstract strategy games or you don't play two player games. This is a two player abstract strategy game. Not much more than that. Um, so much so Smirk and Dagger, a company known for thematic games, didn't even bother to toss a theme on this. This is a game about knocking the opponent's rocks off a grid. While perfect information games like this that challenge each player's ability to play the game instead of relying on random factors, are going to appeal to some gamers, like me. I totally get these aren't for everyone. They definitely are for some people, though, as Shobu, while it hasn't won, has been nominated for four pretty big awards. Mm -hmm. The Origins Award for Best Game in 2020, 
the 2020 American Tabletop Games Best Strategy Game, the 2019 Golden Geek Best Two-Player Board Game, and the 2019 Board Game Quest Awards Best Two-Player Game. Like, look at that list. You got Best Game on there twice. Best Strategy Game, Best Game, and then Best Two-Player and Best Two-Player. Like, like, that is a, a, a impressive list of accolades. And I can't argue its place there, though I'm a little curious to know what beat it out, because uh, I was super impressed by Shobu. Like, if there's something better than Shobu for two-player games that came out, I'm going to have to try that. This just feels like an award-winning game. And honestly, it's one of the best two-player abstract games in my collection. And that's saying a lot, because this is a genre of game that my wife and I dig and that we basically collect. Now, the winners to, that beat it were actually Tiny Towns, Wingspan, and Watergate in two different categories. So right, it's up so there Tiny with some, Towns, some big, yeah. uh, big players. So Tiny Towns would have been a game of the year and Wingspan game of the year or best strategy game or whatever. I get though those fit. Okay. But Watergate, I, it wasn't for me. We, we did not love Watergate. Check out my Watergate <laughs> review to find out why that one didn't work for me. I, I will say right now I would have put Shobu above Watergate. Well, now, if you enjoy this style of game, two-player, perfect information abstract games, you should probably pick up Shobu. Fans of these styles of games should love its easy-to-learn mechanics and difficult-to-master strategies. And if this style of game isn't your cup of tea, give it a pass. While it's a really good abstract game, it's an abstract game. If you don't like those, I don't think Shobu's going to wow you somehow. Well, that's it for our thoughts on Shobu, a great modern abstract strategy game that feels quite classic. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite two-player abstract game? Tell us about it in the comments or head over to our Discord at discord.tabletopbellhop.com and strike up a conversation there. Even if your favorite two-player game is Watergate, as we said many times, not every game is for everyone. It wasn't for me, but surely enough people seem to dig that game. Now, I'll also be writing up a written review of Shobu over on the blog, and I invite you to check that out as well. That'll be over at tabletopbellhop.com. It's time to stop by the asylum and see how the patients are doing in Psychobabble from Outset Media Games. We have to thank for talking us into taking a review copy home from Origins. As an advisement to listeners, this game uses a Cthulhu-esque theme and makes use of the words insane and insanity, as well as concepts of therapy within the game in a manner inappropriate for common language today outside of this semi-historical theme. Psychobabble was designed by Kendrick Winks and features truly fantastic artwork from Eric York. It was originally published by Cheatwell Games in 2022, but is being put out here in North America by Outset Media Games. This mythos-themed social deduction party game plays 4 to 11 players, with a single round of the game taking well under half an hour. The weight here is a bit higher than some social deduction games, and that's mainly due to the fact that there are three different roles in play and different win conditions for each of them. So in Psychobabble, inmates in an asylum have had a shared dream. Some great old one or something is trying to communicate with them. That is, all except one of the inmates who is genuinely insane and had a completely different dream of their own. Now, the trick is no one knows who's insane, not even the insane player. Now, the therapist is trying to figure out what the shared dream was, and the inmates are trying to hide this information while also trying to figure out which one of them is the insane one. For a look at the remarkable looking cards and their art that you get with this shared hallucination, check out our Psychobabble unboxing on YouTube. Now, along with the large tarot size cards and their great artwork, you also get a deck of cards for randomizing what dreams everyone's had, a pair of D6 dice, and a rule book. The rules are quite clear and well explained, and the physical quality of everything is excellent. The only issue I have here, component-wise, is this game is competing with Splendor for the most air in a box. Well, next up, let's get into how you manage all of these fantastical experiences. So one of the big benefits of this game has over as many social deduction games is there's no moderator required. While the therapist kind of runs the session, they are a player as well and has their own role to play. The therapist role starts by sorting the dream selection cards into four decks, then creating a small play deck consisting of a number of cards from one deck equal to the other players in the game minus one and one card from a different deck. These need to be well shuffled so even the therapist doesn't know who's getting what card. 
Now, while this is happening, the rest of the players should lay out the dream cards. There are four different decks of these, and you just make a grid by laying out four cards from each of the four decks, ending up with a 16-card grid. Then the dream selection cards are handed out to the inmates, who should look at their own card but hide that information from all the other players. At the same time, the therapist rolls the two dice, and the inmates identify the matching spot on their selection card, and then use that to figure out what dream card represents rents the dream they just had. Now, once everyone's identified their card, you're ready to start the round. Now, each round of Psycho Babble starts with the inmates describing their dreams, starting with the player to the left of the therapist. Players are free to describe these however they want, with as much detail as they want, but should be aware that the goal of the game for an inmate is to figure out which of them is insane and not let the therapist know what the dream they share. Now, after each player has described their dream, Each inmate gets the chance to ask one question about the dream of one other inmate. This, again, can basically be anything they want, and the player asked is free to answer however they want, which can, but often doesn't need to, include lying. Once all inmates have asked each other questions, it's now the therapist time to do final interviews. They get to ask each inmate one final question and can go in any order. This is their last chance to identify the shared dream. Now, after this final Q&A, play moves to the inmates, again, starting with the one to the left of the therapist. All vote on who is insane. And once you've determined who has the most votes, ties are broken by the therapist, the therapist puts the dice onto the card they think was the shared dream. Now, all of the dream selection cards are revealed. Now, assuming the therapist dealt everything out right, All but one inmate should have the same card. They're labeled A, B, C, or D. The insane inmate will be the one with a different card. If the therapist puts the dice on the proper card, representing the shared dream, they win and the round is over. If the therapist was wrong, the sane inmates win if they identified the insane one among them. And the insane one wins if the inmates pick the wrong person. You're then welcome to play another round with the therapist passing to the player on their left. Now, when playing with four or five players, we usually play until every player has been the therapist once. And I don't know if you'll want to do that with 11 players, but that's an option. Now, with that play overview done, it's time to move on to some of our thoughts on Psychobabble. But first, we want to address the elephant in the room. The language in this game is problematic, and we understand that. While we do not wish to minimize mental illness or its treatment, this game represents a fictional theme and era that is you that use these terms in this way. Yeah, actually, after one of our first games of Psychobabble, we were kind of talking about, like, couldn't you just use other terms, especially with a mythos theme? Like, this could have been less ableist by just having it be an investigator who's interviewing townsfolk, where one of the townsfolk is secretly a cultist. But it is what it is, so let's talk about the game, and we'll let people make their own choices about the language used. So first off, I want to point out the only reason we're even talking about this game is that the rep from Outset Media insisted we take a copy home from Origins. Now, as fans of the show know, I don't generally like social deduction games, and that's being nice. They are the only genre game I will actively avoid and turn down playing. Now, I explained this to the man at Origins, and we also even brought up the, uh, the terminology used in the game, but he wouldn't take no from an answer. He insisted we do a short demo, which we did. And even then, after saying, okay, it's better than I expected, man, that art's cool. It's really not our kind of game. They were like, no, you must take this game. Uh, He went so far to say if we didn't take this, we weren't allowed to take Zensu, which was the game we actually wanted to take home and review from them. So wait a minute. I'm wondering. This guy was a cultist, wasn't he, right? Like this was just his plot to spread the old one's new game to the masses so we could all have the shared, same shared dream. It's funny you should say that because I had this dream. Yeah. A- anyway, this guy was so convinced we would enjoy this game. Even with me not liking social deduction games, they basically forced us to take it home. And you know what? He was right. Let that be a lesson to people. Know your game, know your market, and don't take no for an answer. This fellow was risking a bad review from us, but was so confident in the product that there was no other option but for us to take it. Now, while that first demo didn't really sell me on the game, after playing it with the kids and bringing it out to one of our barbershop bar events, I got to see what makes this game stand out from other social deduction party games. And for me, that's two key things. 
The first one is you are not forced to lie. You and everyone at the table can play this game without spreading a lie. Lying is not necessary or needed to play psychobabble. And while it is permitted, often that's not the best option when that choice comes up. This game is all about figuring out who the insane person is and not giving too much info to the therapist, at least for the inmates, which are the majority of the players in most games. You want people to figure out you had the same dream as you did, as they did. Now, one of the things I dislike most about social deduction games is being forced to lie to my friends and fellow gamers, and possibly even more so, the bad feelings that can come out during and at the end of a game like that. You don't get that here at all. Now, while you can lie, there's almost a sort of nod and a wink included with lies here. As you're working with some people and not others, or in some cases, utterly confused as to what's going on and not even sure if you're one of the dreamers or out on your own. The fact there's a hidden trader rule, but no one knows who that is, including the trader, really is brilliant. This is the second thing to me that's so great about this game, because you no longer have that oddness where there's a stupid phase in the game where like you house rule it. So you don't give away who the trader is like, oh, okay, I'm going to hand you out roll cards and everyone stare at it for at least a minute because the designer made it so that the trader card has way more text than the ones that say you're not a trader and we'll give it away. If you're reading the card longer or there's everyone on the table. So no one can hear the trader moving and pointing at people. Right. I'm, I'm sure people know what games I'm talking about. The other thing, though, is it also removes the stress of being the trader, because depending on the type of person you are, suddenly being that special role, that special outsider and having to play the game different from everyone else can be off putting and not fun for a lot of players. Plus, you're going to have to betray everyone and not everyone's cool with that. And generally speaking, the only real opportunity for lies exists within the dreamers. Once they've determined who the other dreamers likely are. Now I'm going to mention a third thing as well that I also appreciate. And that's the fact that there's no moderator required. Now I will say this is kind of an old problem. That's not really around anymore. Most modern social deduction games have found a way to eliminate that role, but I really like the way psycho babble does it by making the therapist role, a mix of moderator and player. They're actively involved the whole time. They have to be listening to what everyone else is saying. And they have to ask appropriate questions. They need to be paying attention. They're not just sitting back and running the game to watch to see what happens. This is a great way to introduce and teach the game to others, as you can play the role of therapist and no one else really needs to know anything other than the absolute basics to start playing. And that's how I teach this game. I literally just start the game. I, I shuffle the cards, do all the stuff in the background. I get things ready and I'm the one to start asking people questions. I play the therapist the first round. And then often at our public play events, I didn't step away and let the group go after that. Now, where I do find Psycho Babble stumbles a bit is at higher player counts. What I've found is the more players who are inmates who are all trying to describe the exact same card without describing it too clearly, the easier it is for the therapist to figure out what card that is. And so far, we found that once you get up to like six players, it's almost impossible for all the inmates to be vague enough to mislead the therapist. And if they turn to lying to throw the therapist off, then the inmate is too hard to spot and the game goes to that player instead of the therapist. So under the higher the player count, the harder it is for the biggest group of players. Which is interesting because the community right now has six to eight as the best. Mm -hmm. So it would be interesting to hear other people's experiences. Let us know in the comments or on social media if you're a fan of these higher player counts of this game. Now, the thing though, is I'm saying it stumbles, right? It trips a bit. It, it kind of falls over itself because who cares if the therapist wins the most often and who cares if, if people lying too much gives it to the, the inmate, the insane one, like it's a party game. Like most party games, most people playing party games don't really care who won or who had the most points. The, the fun of this game is the experience you had playing together. And there is a lot of fun to be had in describing your dreams based on cards and asking other people and hearing other people's descriptions and the back and forth and laughing out loud when someone asks the perfect question or someone gives an answer and you're like, what? That makes it out, but ah. 
And really, we haven't talked about the Kardar here yet, yeah. which is very worth mentioning. Now, before that, though, another thing worth bringing up is that this game does require some thinking on your feet. There is an improv element here that may turn off some players. No, this isn't some kind of narrative RPG. You're not expected to come up with a whole character backstory based on the cards you've chosen. Um, you're just describing what you see on an art card. And the amount you say isn't determined by the rules at all. Like you can just say, tell me about your dream. Go, it was spiky. That's it. You're done. You've done your description. Now, I have noticed that actual indie RPG players tend to be a little bit more elaborate when describing their dreams, but that's not at all required here. Now, how much or how little of this art you describe really can help or hinder the eventual outcome. But there's also a good chance that your description, no matter how involved, still might not help. Yeah, and that's because of the fantastic art in this game. Right. One of the brilliance of the art here is how similar things there are in all the cards. Like it's not quite a game of spot it where there's at least one similarity in every card. But you can describe sparky, spiky and it might mean 12 of the 16 cards on the table. And then someone else will say windows. Now you've narrowed it down to six, but you still only got it down to six. And I just love the way this art works. Like it's it's got an early D&D line drawing Earl Otis kind of mashed with Jack Kirby's cosmic Marvel weirdness and some modern dungeon crawl classic line art style that I just love. I think it's fantastic. And then even cooler is each individual deck of cards. I and mean, there's four different decks. They each have kind of a different theme to them. When you set them up so the cards are next to each other, they form a trippy panorama, which just looks great. Like the card artwork is actually the main reason I agreed to take this game home because I'm like, if nothing else, I get a bunch of really cool cards and I kind of want to use them to make a DCC adventure at some point. So the art here tends towards both abstract and repeatable in concept, if not actual features. Again, with like mm -hmm. that spiky and windows, uh, the description you're giving may actually refer to multiple cards without you even knowing or perhaps very yeah. deliberately doing knowing so on your part. Yeah, overall, I got to say I'm impressed by Psycho Babble. Like here you have a social deduction party game that even I can enjoy. It avoids what I consider the pitfalls of most social deduction games by not requiring lying and making it so the outsider doesn't know they're an outsider. I've had a lot of fun playing Psycho Babble, and it has been a huge hit with the local gaming community. As someone who also avoids social deduction, I too was on the fence. But sitting down and playing four or five rounds of it in a row was really great fun. And that was with both kids and adults at the table. I immediately wanted to introduce the game to others at public events. So if you enjoy social deduction games in general, if you play games like Werewolf, The Resistance, or even Battlestar Galactica, or its re-theme Unfathomable, you're going to want to add Psycho Babble to your collection. Well, it does change things up a bit. I don't think there's anything here that takes away from what you know and love. I don't think there's anything that would turn away social deduction fans. If what you love about them is lying to your fans, you can still do that in this game. You just don't have to. Well, perhaps not as problematic as some games, the terms used in this game may turn off some people, and that's understandable. Yeah. I do think it's worth mentioning to new players before settling in for a game to avoid any awkwardness or discomfort. While these are common tropes in uh, Eldric fiction, the game needs to be presented in that way. Now, if you're looking for a big group party game with lots of talking interaction, lots of social things going on here psycho babble could be the perfect game i don't know a lot of games that go up to 11 players that don't involve a lot of dice drawing or trivia this one is great for getting people talking both in game but also after each round when players are asking each other what do you mean by this or what the heck you said spooky where's the spooky on that card I thought you meant something completely different. Oh, you said spiky. Wow, I heard that wrong. <laughs> it's also quick. So playing multiple rounds, even at large player counts, doesn't eat up a lot of time. and gives players opportunities to take on the multiple roles. Now, the important group I hope this review reaches and goes out to, and I, I'm worried it won't because we're immediately calling it a social deduction game. And people are going to tune out. Is people like me, people who don't generally like social deduction games. You might want to give this a shot, just like I did. I had way more fun talking about shared dreams and mythos landscapes than I thought I would. At this point, I expect this is going to become a barbershop bar regular, and I can totally see breaking this out at the next birthday party or gaming in the new year. Well, there you have it, a social deduction game that even won over Mo. 
Thanks, yeah. Outset Games, for convincing him to bring this one home. We say it often, not every game is for everyone, and that's awesome. But what was the last game that you didn't think would be your cup of tea, but that you ended up really enjoying? Tell yeah. us about it in the comments below. Now get a look at some of the great looking cards in the game by checking out my written review of Psycho Babble over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And if you enjoyed this review, I also encourage you to tip your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. And now in the Bellhop's Tabletop, we look back at the games we played since the last episode. Uh, so lots going on this week and too little of it was gaming. Uh, kids are back in swimming lessons, which I've got to say, it wasn't cheap, but paying for private lessons has made all the difference. Having one instructor with my two older kids is way better than them being in a group that included kids as young as five. Um, you need to put a 16 year old with a five year old and try to teach them both to swim at the same time. Right. So, so that's, that's, that's a shout out to the, I don't even know who runs it. It's, it's whatever public works Windsor it's at the local pools, but yes, the private lessons so far are going way better. Um, I have been able to get some gaming in and I've been able to do some stuff because I haven't had to bring the kids back to practice after every session. So that's cool. Um, this week's looking a little rough, but we did get in a few games. First up, a couple games of Star Frontiers, technically the um, new version. I'm um, already Star Realms there. I messed it up again. That's why every time this game, <laughs> Star Realms Frontiers, I'm missing a word. Couple of games of Star Realms, the four player box set Frontiers edition um, with Gwen at Kava in La Salle. Because I figured I brought Jen last week, so I owed it to Gwen to take her out there. Plus, it's an excuse I get to have Kava for lunch, and I like that place, and they have very good food. So, yeah. never going to go wrong with more coffee shop time. Yeah, good coffee, too. Even better, they, they have a reward program, right? After so many, whatever, that it tracks it digitally. But, um, after 10, you get any drink you want, which is impressive. Like you, you can go for like an extra large mocha or you can get, you know, a coffee. And I'm like there. Now, that's that's the day I don't mind getting the big fancy, <laughs> fancy drink. Um, now, what I what I was happy about is Gwen did show more appreciation for Star Realms uh, than Jen did. Um, she even managed to beat me in the first game, which which, as Deanna will admit in the chat, is is not easy to do because I've played a lot of Star Realms. Uh, but she got an early blob combo going, like just her first two purchases. The first round was a combo. Um, and I just couldn't counter it in time. Like I just didn't get enough outposts to stop. it. Um, right now, Star Realms is just in a weird spot for me. Cause like, it's totally like you reconnect with that old friend. Right. And you're like, oh, you're going to meet up for coffee, but you haven't seen each other in way too long. And then you show up. But as soon as you're together, it's like you never had any time apart. Well, I'm having that. With, with star realms completely like i keep thinking is why didn't i keep up with this game all along because all i owned before was the base game which i bought three copies of because there was this like six-headed hydra variant i really like to play but like i never bought colonies i never bought the the uh, gambit packs like I, I never did any of that and i'm like why did it take till origins 2023 to get back into star realms and i think one look at the pile of obligation not to mention the pile of shame and really kind of answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, the year I brought Sorcerer home from Wise Wizard, I should have brought home all of the Star Realms. Not that we dislike Sorcerer, just Star Realms is better. Uh, next up, it's time to make Sean jealous because later in the week, I also fit in two games of Kapow. Uh, technically, Kapow Volume 1. Now, one of the things I will point out, we did unboxing videos for these the other day, and I've sat down to read the rules. They are just barely, barely, just a tiny bit, slightly different in the fact that I think there is one paragraph in the volume two rules that is not in the other. And while they did a cool thing where all the examples were updated with characters from the specific sets, um, it's the same set of rules. Like, so if you're going to play, grab the Kapow volume two rules. And that one paragraph was something that I already found pretty clear and had to do with playing four players. Um, so you might as well assume I'm talking about either version of Kapow. Um, we started off the first game, um, just the standard board, right? Like everyone gets a standard board of powers and things you can do. And your opponent gets the same standard board. And we beat each other up. And um, I think Gwen won that one. Yeah, Gwen won that one. Uh, pretty random. But then we played a second round where I gave her the three villains that come in the set. And I took the three heroes. 
Sorry, I don't remember the names of the characters. I only played once, but I played a tank character. And that first game was good. I, it, superhero Yahtzee, I've heard the game called. And it wasn't a roll and write, but it's a, it's a, I don't know, I wouldn't call it a worker placement, but it kind of is because if your dice were workers, but calling them workers when you're activating superpowers sounds weird. We, we played that, it was okay. It, like, I'm like, ah, that's our game. But the second game with characters was great. And while you all know how much I love asymmetry, so I think that was the key. Plus, it just like it. There were reasons to draft different dice, and once you throw the asymmetry, you don't even start with the same dice. Like, yeah, you're all on the same board. Like Gwen's playing, she's like, I just realized I have no way to generate shields. I have no purple dice, and none of my other dice have shields on them. I totally missed that. So here she is playing this character, realizing partway through the game that she can't defend at all unless using wild card dice. So uh, does it feel super? That's my first question. Like, does it feel I- like a superhero game? I think so. I like you play way more superhero games than I do. I think part of the key is though, is you kind of got a Lords of water deep it. And instead of going, I do six damage to you. How much did you defend for? You go, you know what? I went with a fist of fury with a drop kick kicker. And I boosted that with other power name. Then I think it feels super. If you, you get into describing what you're doing that way. And the rule book even recommends that before you start the game, the villain character described the plot that the hero is trying to prevent. But like none of that's in the rules. Right. So you can play it very mechanically. So I think it's as much a superhero game as Lords of Waterdeep is a D&D game. Oh, well, that's a, a little unfortunate because, you know, my feelings <laughs> Lords of Waterdeep. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's why I chose that particular yeah, game yeah. as the example, right? Because it is really easy to just switch to mechanical. But I found with the players, you got more of it. So I don't know Gwen's character, what she was doing. She had to, she seemed to have things where she could suck health out of me. So if she hit me, she'd heal as much. But I was playing a tank character that I've got to say felt like a tank character. And it was a character. So you have attack powers, defense powers, and then kind of like level up powers. They don't call it level up, but I play a lot of role-playing games. So I think of it as level up. And you have your attack power and you have like four different basic attacks you can do. Then you have a list of kickers. And then a list of multipliers. And the thing is, you have to do a basic attack, but then you add the kickers and multipliers to it. And those, of course, require more dice. And defense is the same. There's base defense, and then there's a bunch of kickers and multipliers. So you start off, well, my defense character automatically got a base defense of one for free. So I didn't have to spend a die on it. Then he had another power that I thought was huge, which let me use my defense kickers, but to add to attacks. So I was just doing like basic attacks, but super defense, but my defense hurt the opponent where that felt thematic, right? It felt like a character that was whatever, putting on shields and, and, you know, putting on his armor and leveling up his armor and doing the Iron Man thing. So I think it was thematic that way. Um, Deanna, uh, Deanna, sorry, uh, Gwen was frustrated by her character. So I, I think that was more a case of her not realizing how she should play it. So I couldn't tell you, like, I, I know she did some things where it's like, if you did this, this happens. Like, uh, if she hit me, she sucked damage, she sucked, healed, which she used to good effect. But then she wasn't defending. And meanwhile, I was defending like crazy. So at second game, right? right. It's we, We're two games in, so I can't say too much about it. I'd love to hear from you how thematic you feel it is. So I'm guessing you were playing Tough Nut. Yes. Uh, yes. The, uh, and uh, I, yeah, she could have been playing. Spoiler? A spoiler alert? It might have been spoiler alert. Uh, spoiler alert. Victor Kane and Coquette are the uh, three. The no, villains. it was Croquette. Coquette? It was Croquette. Or Coquette, Croquette, whatever. Uh, so what, the, uh, yes, the, the, the swappable dice faces. Uh, you haven't even mentioned that yet. Like, does that, how I, does that play in? It was neat. Um, I have a quality concern with it because we each had one die that had one side we couldn't get a face to stick on. Oh, which is highly concerning. That is. Um, what I didn't do is try a bunch of different faces. Like maybe it was just a particular combination of that face with that die. Um, so that was concerning. It it was different. I, I, it's so hard to describe. So you always have these dice. And you can put sides on them, but they're not the ones Rio Grande came up with, which I think were better quality. These are new customizable dice. And I think this might lead to a whole new thing for White Wizard, as long as more people don't have complaints with stuff not sticking. Um, but what I what I didn't expect was you can spend blank dice. And mm. a lot of things you can spend blank dice. Like the basic attack is any die, or I think it was the basic attack. So 
you join if you if we're playing a basic game, you start with one of every colored die, and the color of the dice really just tell you the symbol that matches that color is half that die. Because they're all D6s. So like the yellow might dice have might symbols on half the sides. The red power dice have three of the sides are power. Well, then your custom die, if you're playing a basic game, starts with one lightning bolt, which is a wild card. So you have a one in six chance of getting a die you can spend anywhere. But there are all kinds of ways where you can spend blank dice. And that's what I wasn't expecting. So it went start off and you're like, OK, so I use that die most of the time for kickers and stuff like to, to put with something. So I'm like, I have a power die, but because I have the blank die I can spend, I can put it with it. So instead of attacking one, I'm attacking for three. So that was interesting fact to it. The other thing is I was surprised how many things gave you sides. Mm. So you can gain sides while you're attacking. You can gain sides while you're defending without using that whole power up column of the board, which all requires the blue dice or the symbol on the blue dice, which is the X factor. Well, it ends up the X factor is only on blue dice and one of the other dice. So it's hard to get. So what happens is you end up picking these attack and defense kickers that give you sides. And they kind of pile up on the side until the end of the round. And then you get to put them on your dice and rearrange them and change them. And what I found most games is you sat there and you started to add a couple extra sides to your dice, but you didn't mind that they were blank sometimes to eventually trying to get them to be wild cards so that your big dice were wild cards. Plus one of the bigger powers and one of the bigger kickers for attack and defense was you just have to use one of the customizable dice with any side up that's not blank. So even adding anything to it made it so there was a better chance you can do some of the earlier kickers. Like it's, it sounds weird using all these keywords. And if you saw it, so it just, I don't know, it just felt different than I expected from the demo. Like I'm like, when I played the demo, I'm like, I hey, have this D6 with one special side. You're probably going to want to upgrade that as quick as possible. And I'm like, well, the blank sides aren't, can be better. It's not a bad thing having them. So it was just. There were more options. I think that besides being customizable, that die unlocked more options than I expected it to. Fair enough. Uh, what about weight? I, I saw some mention of them being really light. It just didn't feel, you know. It's light. It's, yeah. it's, there's a lot of decisions though. Like I, I'm going to give it a two. Sorry. No, I'm an actual physical weight of the, oh, the yes. side, those, those dice. Yes. Those yeah, they're, dice. Light. <laughs> they're light. I, I don't know. I, if anyone's ever played any of the Lego dice games, that's what they feel like. Okay. I mean, if yeah, it's a, immediately. The, the game is a 1.67. So be so weight wise. It's definitely, yeah, I, I would have said, I would have said a two though, like just okay. the number of decisions. Like, it's not like you roll your dice and go, that goes there, that goes there, that goes there, that goes there. What do I do with this last one? If there's an agonizing, okay, how do I best use these? Especially once you had characters, knowing that Gwen is probably going to do this thing that sucks life off of me. And then there's some, uh, like, again, poker style social deduction where there's a bunch of powers on the right that go off based on what your opponent did. So, like, for every die the opponent added to their dice pool this turn, you gain six life, which is huge. But you have to make that prediction that they're going to add a die. So it, it, there was more to it. Like, but yeah, physically, they're very light dice. But I, I, I played the Rio Grande games, Roll for the Galaxy, that has customizable dice. And we own, I think, every Lego dice game that was published because I thought it was awesome Lego was making dice games. These are very similar to the Lego ones, though the sides stay on the Lego ones a little better. All right. Well, we'll be looking for more forward to more of that. And I certainly want to get it, get it at the table. Yeah, that's not on like BGA, is it? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, I just wonder. I'm like, we could play a quick game there. Um, so the only other one I have to talk about this week is Castle Panic, which, yes, we're still getting there. Um, this time we broke out the Engines of War expansion. Um, I fully expected, looking ahead, that this was going to be too much. I thought this was the Catan the Catapult, or, uh, or to me, the Princess and the Dragon. I thought this is where the game was going to jump the shark. You're adding an entire resource deck in, and I'm thinking it's a what Catan and Castle Panic. We're gonna have to trade with each other and trade resources to build things. And yeah, that's actually what it does. But it worked really well. And it really, more so than any other expansion so far, felt like it gave us a new level of player agency. So you were hoping that uh, as you got through these last possible expansions, you may get back to that early feeling of a fun and frivolity. It sounds like you <laughs> didn't get that. No, not from this, not th this one. This one did not. 
Um, this one still had some fun new things, and there was some. I'm one of the best things about adding these expansions is pulling something new from the bag you've never seen before. Unfortunately, Castle Panic's a game where you win by defeating everything in the bag, so you're only going to get that once out of each expansion. So I'm going to miss that. Like the next we, the next, I don't think the next expansion adds any new monsters. So I, that's one of the things I do miss out of. I, I miss that exploration aspect. Um, now what this expansion does add is you take out all the brick and mortar cards from the deck. You now have an engineer, which is a sideboard you put to the side of the board, um, which props to Fireside Games for diverse artwork. You got an older black dude on one side and a younger redhead woman on the other. Um, you now have a resource deck, which has um, brick and mortar, obviously, but also rope. And uh, and um, there's something else. I'm missing one. I can't remember what the other one is. There's the stone, maybe. I can't remember. There, there, whatever. There's four resources now, not just brick and mortar. Um, there's, yeah, I can't remember what the last one is. But anyway, um, when playing with Wizards Tower, which we now use in every game, your hand size is now six. So you get five Castle Panic cards and one resource card. And then when you're drawing cards at the start of your turn, when you're drawing up to your hand size of six, you pick what to draw. So you're like, uh, I'm going to take two castle cards and three resources because, man, we really want to finish that ballista this turn. And the interesting thing is you can draw one at a time. You're like, I'm going to draw a resource. Oh, that didn't work. All right, give me another resource. Okay, and with your rope, we can trade. Okay, now I'll draw castle cards for the rest. You're certainly uh, still gaming more uh, gamerness, uh, gamer, yeah. gamer side. Uh, this is not drifting back towards the randomness uh, no. of the original <laughs> game. No, no, definitely more player agency, which which I do appreciate. And and I'll I'll, I'll get into a bit more. Um, just a bit more overview here is you're gonna use the resources to build things. Uh you can now build pit traps, uh rope traps, which amuse me because they fling the mobs back to the forest and just like picturing the the Looney Tune style uh string trap amuses me. Uh fortifications, which are basically walls that you put out in the middle of the map. They work the same, like they stop, they stop enemies, they take one damage, and the wall's removed. Um, two big things you can build now is a ballista and a catapult. And there's now a new tower that goes in the center of the board, which I guess it looks really cool. And there's little cardboard tokens that go on top if you built the ballista and catapult. Um, you can attack with these, but they only attack one arc. And what you actually do now is turn this new tower to show which way it's facing, which totally reminded me of Star Trek Castle Panic, where you turn the Enterprise. Oh, I'm sure that it's probably one or the two of them uh, inspired the other one. Yeah, I'm not sure which came first. Uh, the neat part with the middle tower is it's not required to win. Like, like it's you don't lose if it's destroyed. And the only way for it to get destroyed is like for a boulder to come through when there's already the wall and the tower mm -hmm. gone. And yes, you can rebuild it. Plus, like I said, it looks cool. Um, but to counter all this like awesome new stuff you can build, the enemies obviously get tougher, right? So what they gave them is siege engines. Now your castle really is under siege because you've got siege engines coming at you. And each engine's manned by two orcs. So when you put them out, you put the siege engine out and you grab two orcs and put them underneath. And you can't touch these orcs because they're protected by the siege engines. Ah, uh, they're rough. Um, they tend to only have like two, three health, but they have all kinds of things that, that protect them and they move funky. Like one of them moves forward and then randomly goes left or right. Um, they're hugely powerful when they hit your walls. Uh, the siege tower specifically takes no damage when it takes out one of your walls. It does stop. But then when it moves into the castle, it stops on the line. Like it stops on that spot on the castle ring, dumps its two orcs, which start attacking your towers, but then sits there for the rest of the game because there's now a siege engine instead of your wall and enemies pass right through it. And it prevents you from building a wall because there's a siege weapon there. Uh, the other neat thing they added was uh, there are two names. I don't remember the, both the names, but they're forward camps. And these are things you don't have to defeat to end the game, but it changes how monsters spawn. Like one of them goes in the archer ring, and any time that color comes up, the monsters spawn in the archer ring instead of the forest. That's the forward camp. And then there's another one that's like a bivouac or something, and the first monster drawn every turn goes there. Oh, that's rough. It's just neat stuff. <laughs> that's cool, but definitely rough too. Yeah. But like now you can build pit traps and all this other stuff to counteract it. Now I actually thought. This was going to be too much. This this was, I, I thought this was, like I said, it was going to jump. This is just too much to keep track of, too much stuff. But honestly, this is one of the most fun expansions yet. And this felt like I went from a cooperative party game to a cooperative hobby game. 
And I think that was the intention. Like here, I almost feel like I now have a complete medium weight Euro cooperative game, something up there with other cooperative tower defense style games, right? Like Defender of the Realms or something like that. And I think that was the intention. And honestly, I think it's a good thing. So it took a bit to get there, but you finally, it, this finally, this random sort of, not dice chucker, but close enough, uh, <laughs> has finally become a uh, a game. It just took all of the expansions to get there. Yeah, and, <laughs> and the middle there was kind of iffy, right? Like, I was like, I, it doesn't know what it wants to be. It wants to be a light party game, but it's taking two hours. Well, now it doesn't feel like it was supposed to be a light party game. It feels like it should be an hour and a half to two hour experience and its own unique thing. <laughs> Now, what I haven't done and I don't think I'm going to do before the reviews is try to mix and match. Like like playing the base game with Engines of War may just give it that feel. Like skip out the, the I, I actually, the kids and I were talking about, we're like, I think I ditched the the Titans or whatever it's called, uh, Rise of the Titan, I think it's what it's called. No, uh, whatever. The one with the big boss that shows up, Agronok or whatever. I think I dumped that one out. They love the Wizard's Tower. My kids do. They like the Wizard spells because how powerful they are. I don't know. So while we are getting ready to play this, like uh, we play these over at my mother-in-law's and dinner was still wasn't ready. So I've read the rules for Ends of the War. So I skipped ahead to look out the new one, the brand new with the second edition, latest expansion. And I was shocked to learn. And I almost feel like I, I took the wrong path here is it's supposed to be base game only. That specifically says this is not designed to work with any expansions and gameplay could be wildly varied. Note, this has not been play tested with the expansions at all. So I was a little shocked by that because I kind of felt like I was building up to this final expansion. Now it's like, okay, take all of everything you learned and forget it. Let's go back to the base game, which actually kind of fits what I was saying last week, where I kind of want to jump back to that feel of the base game. So I guess we get to see that. Uh, so we ended the night with putting everything back. <laughs> the base game state, which I got to say props to Fireside again, because the, the insert and the diagram and getting it back to base game was pretty easy. All right. Well, that's it for what we have been playing. What about what we plan to play next? Any gaming plans for the coming week? Uh, so Deanna is finally feeling much better. Um, we ended up getting a great last minute offer on a room at Jack's Castro pub. So we're actually going to take advantage, take a couple days off. Now, that said, I'm sure there will be some two-player gaming going down. I'm um, probably featuring a few of the games on tonight's Ask the Bellhop episode over at the Banded Groose and Grow Breweries while we're out of town. As one would expect. Uh, and there's going to be uh, some gaming in public as well. Before we head out of town, we do have our next Barbershop Bar game night. That is this coming Saturday. I realize for anyone listening at home or watching this on YouTube, it's already passed. I'm sorry. But for everyone here live in the chat, we are getting together at the Barbershop Bar on Walker, and I hope to see all of you locals there. Um, that that should be more games to talk about there. Um, expect me to bring a lot of what I brought last week. Um, I might bring out Kapow. I haven't tried it for a player yet. Um, but two-player-only games aren't great for that kind of event, so I don't, I'm not sure on that one. Definitely be bearing in Psycho Babble if you hadn't had a chance to try that yet. It'll be out at our next event. Now, after we get back, from our time, our staycation, whatever. We're not going like, you know, countries away, only 45 minute drive. Uh, we're meeting up with the Hatchman himself, Dyson Logos, um, and his girlfriend for their first trip down to Windsor. Yes, the hand drawn map guy is coming down to Windsor, and this is because of my food porn picks. Um, and he wants me to show him around and show him some of the best food that Windsor has to offer. Now, Deanna is like, we're forcing her to play games. We're bringing games. And I'm hoping for at least a bit of gaming going down. But I can't promise anything for there. But I might have some food to talk about during the next coffee break. So before we start locking things down, let's take a moment to thank a selection of our Tabletop Bellhop Patreon patrons. Their support has kept this show going for five years so far, with a lot more to come. Jeff, Sheila, and Clara Seuss, thank you. Kat, Tori, and Clark. Thank you. Brian Van Beek. Thank you, Brian. William Fisher. Thank you, William. Danielle and Owen Thomas. Thanks for the topic tonight. Well, that was our double bell. That means the shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the lobby doors.
Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at TabletopBellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Again, I invite you to keep the conversation going by joining us on the Tabletop Bellhop Discord over at discord.tabletopbellhop.com, and you can explain to me exactly why I am wrong about Watergate. Well, that's all for us tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us live, and be sure to stick around for the Penthouse Suite after show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.